Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and today we're talking about the concept of a gentle cesarean birth and about microbiome seeding. I have two really special guests in the studio today, and I deeply appreciate both of you in general, and especially for joining us for this topic tonight. You may recognize Dr. Emiliano Shavira from our episodes called Breach 101. Hi. Hey, welcome (laughs) back. And preterm labor. Dr. Shavira is an obstetrician and maternal fetal medicine specialist. Welcome back to the program. It's great to be back. Also tonight, we have two guests in one. Candace (laughs) is expecting her first baby and due in about a month. Candace found out a few weeks back that her baby is in a breech position and so far hasn't budged. Uh, Candace had planned for an all-natural birth, but now is having to give thought to a cesarean birth if your baby stays breech. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. So how long ago did you find out your baby was breech? Um, Two weeks, yeah, 34 weeks, and I'm 36 weeks now. And what kinds of things have you done to try to change that? Oh, so many different things. Um, working with you, of course, acupuncture, moxibustion, standing on my head for half of the day, mm, drinking a ton of water. I'm trying it all, and I potentially will be doing a version in a week as well. The external cephalic version? Yes. Okay, so what kind of birth? I mean, wh- now your choices may become more limited. Mm-hmm. I always... It's funny to say that with Dr. Shavir here because he's one of the last Mohicans who still delivers breech babies vaginally um, around here. But um, if your choices do become limited, you'll, you will you may be looking at a cesarean birth, right? That's correct. And um, I know for you, that's not what you were planning for. What was your original plan? My original plan being someone, I was trying not to plan too much. It was like, go with the flow. The only thing I don't want is a cesarean. That uh-huh. was basically it. I wanted to go as natural as possible. I was open to an epidural. I wasn't like going to tell myself, no matter what, you can't do an epidural. But I wanted to try doing it without. I just really didn't want a cesarean, to How be come? honest. Why? Mm, well, I'm fearful of surgery, the recovery, the pain. And then secondly, I wanted to have almost like a spiritual experience with birthing a child. I only planned to have one. And I just, I'm I'm a natural girl. I do everything holistically and naturally. So I just felt really comfortable doing that. It's a great birth plan. (laughs) Which one? Her birth plan. Spiritual and natural? Yeah, everything she said. It's a great birth plan. Yeah, except her birth plan only had one rule, which was no cesarean. <laughs> except it's completely, <laughs> potentially, out the window. Head, which is all parented, I think. <clears throat> this is what so, everyone keeps telling me. Oh, you just one. your baby girl is just preparing you for what parenting is going to be like. And I've been getting that, that line in one form or another. Have you ever had surgery? No, I've only had my wisdom teeth out. That's as far as surgery's gone Mm. for me. How was that? Well, they put me under, so it wasn't... Oh. Just the thought of being awake and the whole thing and being strapped down and I don't know. I faint when I get my blood taken, put it that way. Do you really? I do. Oh, No, I thought I was the only one, so I feel better now. (laughs) Uh, So this is a big hurdle for me. Actually, it's probably not as startling when you faint. When you get your blood taken, mm-hmm. but when the like big hairy man comes in and sits down, and I'm like, okay, okay, go gentle on me, and then I get all woozy on it. It right. just feels a little worse. <laughs> it's like that time my wife bought me professional hockey skates because they were on sale for like eighty percent off, and then I went to ice skate for the first time, <laughs> and everybody <laughs> thought, oh, that guy's gonna be a great skater, and I'm clinging onto the wall for dear life. Mm. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that uh, it's you came on a great night because Dr. Shabir is here, and the the title for tonight is Gentle Cesarean. Yeah. And traditionally, cesarean section or cesarean birth was two things happening at the same time. There is a surgical procedure going on, and there is a birth going on. 
And I think originally when we started doing them out of necessity, we had to focus 100% of the effort on the surgical procedure to keep the mother and the baby alive and to keep them safe and healthy because we weren't good at it. We learned a lot in the past 120 years or so. Uh, But now that it's sort of down to a science, it's possible to shift some of that attention and focus, some of that spotlight from the surgical procedure to the simultaneously occurring birth, which you said you wanted a spiritual experience. And I I have the sense that you can still have a, it is a very sacred, beautiful moment when your baby comes into the world, whether it's an inch higher or an inch lower. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot you can do to uh, shine the spotlight on that sacred moment and not miss out on that moment. So I would like to talk to Dr. Shabir a little bit, just procedurally, what are the steps of the cesarean in general? And then maybe we can talk about how it can be made more gentle or more sacred. Um, Sure. Uh, So let's pretend that um, we're not talking about um, a real serious emergency that's, you know, sometimes done very, very quickly. Let's say this is either a planned cesarean or maybe in, in labor something just not going well and we're deciding to go ahead and do the cesarean at that, t- that, that, that time, but not necessarily, you know, super huge emergency. So what usually would happen is you would have a conversation with the OB about, uh, you know, the reason for doing the C-section and, and uh, they, they run over some of the general risks related to uh, surgery and they, they talk about the anesthesia, which you may or may not have already. So if you're, let's say you're in labor and you don't have an epidural, um, and they might talk about giving you a, a, a spinal, uh, which is uh, a one-shot um, injection in, in the back that puts you numb, let's say, from the rib cage down, from the belly button down. Or you may already have the epidural in place, and you are using that in labor, and that epidural can be used for the cesarean as well. So you kind of you have these conversations usually in the labor room. Uh, most of the time, you have one family member or friend or somebody is going to uh, come into the OR with you. They uh, Most, uh, you know, hospitals and ORs allow one person. So the mom will usually go in first together with the anesthesiologist and they, uh, they, um, they sit you on the table and they take care of the anesthesia part of it. So maybe they need to place the spinal. Or if you already have the epidural, they give you an extra dose uh, to really numb you up for the C-section. Mm-hmm. They connect you to all the monitors and stuff. Uh, so this is to keep an eye on mom's vital signs. So they connect you to an EKG and a pulse oximeter and maybe give you a little oxygen through a face mask and kind of get you all ready to go. Um, then uh, they have you lay down on the operating table. And um, some places will kind of strap your arms down. Some won't. I, I think that really the concept is just to keep you from touching the the sterile, sterile field. Yeah. Uh, that that's something I think that could be optional. Then they prepare the belly. So there's these different uh, special soaps that are used to to try to sterilize the skin. So they wash off the belly, and then they put the drapes on to to cover everything up. Historically, these drapes are usually um, not clear. They tend to be. Um, you know, like a blue color. And so you actually, when you're, you know, your head and shoulders are above the drape and you can't see anything, you know, going on below. So you don't see the surgery. You don't see the cutting. You also don't see the, the birth of the baby. Uh, so they get that all set up. Is the purpose of that drape so you don't see what's happening? Pro- probably in part. Uh, um, the principal purpose of it is to protect the sterile field, mm-hmm. you know, to create a sterile field so that, you know, we don't get infection at the at the side of the incision. Okay, to minimize but there's infection. probably a secondary, you know, role of, um, you know, minimizing people seeing what's going on during the surgery. The assumption being that, you know, people are going to freak out, and you know, maybe that's a correct assumption, or maybe that's a wrong assumption. Um, well, Candace, are, are you are you more worried about what you might see or what you might feel? We're both. It depends. If I if I was able to feel something when I shouldn't be, then that would be terrifying. But my fear is if I see something that's over the top or traumatic that I'm going to faint. Mm-hmm. That's one of my big fears. And, oh. Or I'll like go into like some convulsion or something. And 
basically kind of dropped the ball on the whole situation. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to handle it. That's one way I can describe it. Okay. Mm. So maybe not seeing it's probably good for some people. Oh, sure. for sure. Mm-hmm. Not seeing it's good for some people. And other people really want to see it. And I think yeah. it'll be better for them to see it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's a, a drape in place. So they put the drape. And then uh, usually we do uh, w- uh, one final test to make sure this the skin is completely numb. How do you uh, do that? Uh, either you take a clamp or a pincher and you just pinch, you pinch the living daylights out of the skin. Okay. <laughs> and we listen for a scream. Okay. So if you hear a scream, that's a positive sign that the, then uh, we need to work a little bit more at the anesthesia. If there is no scream, then we know the anesthesia is working. Got it. Uh, so once we've um, uh, you know assured that the, that the anesthesia is working well, that's usually when they bring the partner in. We're just about ready to start. There's these days. There's also timeout procedures. So the OR team will talk about um, you know who. Uh, this person is that we're doing surgery on. They'll go over their, you know, date of birth, medical record number, what the planned procedure is, all the details about, you know, her specific case so that everybody's, you know, on board and up to date and has all the correct information, uh, trying to minimize, you know, surgical errors and so forth. How long are you alone? Uh, It depends on how long it takes to get the anesthesia really cooking. So, you know, it could be uh, 10, 15 minutes. It could be half an hour just why do why do they want you to be alone for that like not be able to have your partner with you great question um there's a there's a lot of of um you know lore out there about uh uh, people witnessing uh medical procedures and maybe not being able to handle it and Mm. you know you hear things about like dad's fainting and um uh, so just kind of trying to minimize the the drama you get from lay people witnessing medical stuff just to kind of keep keep a very I don't know what's the word just a just a calm and and, and professional sort of atmosphere now that that you know there may be some good things about that but then it, like everything there's the downsides you know that uh, may, maybe the patient would be a lot more calm with some family in there and that maybe it would be you know much more helpful. I mean, it seems like the separation of partner is traumatizing for the laboring mom. Yeah. Uh, And it also seems like there's ways to, well, selectively, you know, figure out who's not going to do well, who might Mm -hmm. really not do well by watching an epidural be placed in their partner. Um, or, Or to sort of block that to some degree, just like you do with the drape. But it definitely seems like it could be less emotionally traumatizing if a woman can have her partner there. Do they make the partner leave to do an epidural during a vaginal birth? Uh, commonly they so. do. Really? Commonly they do. So I, I would not say that that's 100% universal, but it's very common. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I remember an old uh, um, uh, colleague of mine who used to, who would tell this story about a father that uh, that that fainted during an epidural placement, went over backwards, knocked his head on the ground, and actually had to go to the ER. Was very seriously injured, hmm. and and you know it's it's sort of those kind of horror stories that generate policy. The policy <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. All right, so then partner comes back in. Okay, so uh, so partner comes back in. Basically, everything is ready to go, and uh, and then and then that's when you start the cesarean. So you want to go through the procedure? Is that okay, Candice? When yeah. you talk through the steps, I think okay. this is good. Slowly become more comfortable. Yeah, uh, I mean, there there really are um, um, just a, a, a few basic steps mm-hmm. with cesarean. I mean, it's a simple matter of uh, you do an incision on the skin. Uh, for the most part, except for uh, unus- unusual circumstances or special circumstances, the the incision is horizontal, and it's kind of just under the bikini line. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you there's a little bit of fat below the skin, so you go through these layers. Cutting cutting through those layers. Mm-hmm. About how wide? Um, maybe maybe uh, something like 14 centimeters, roughly. Some people make them smaller. Some people make them bigger. Depends also the size of the baby. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
So uh, then you encounter the muscles, and the most common type of incision, you don't cut the muscles, but you can, pick, you can imagine them, they're like a curtain. So you, so you divide them in the midline, and you, pu- you pull the muscles laterally like you would be pulling the curtains open. Oh, and there's space in the middle? And there's space in the middle, yeah. And then, uh, and then your final layer, there's, there's like a sac that contains all of your innards, you know, the intestines and livers. That's called the peritoneum. So you, you encounter that as your final layer. It's a very thin little layer, and you pick it up and snip it with a scissor to open it. And then you're in. Now you're looking at the uterus. Uh, and so the, um, uh, the, the front of the uterus also has the bladder on it down low. So usually we create a little incision there to be able to peel the bladder down off of the uterus. Okay. And then you're ready to deliver the baby. You take a scalpel and do another horizontal incision down low on the uterus. This is the most uh, common incision done on the uterus. There's other types of incisions, but they're used in you know, special circumstances. So for your routine C-section, you'll have this low transverse incision. And usually the right below that is a uh, baby's head or face. Okay. So that you reach a hand into the incision and you really wrap around the baby's head and lift the head up into the incision so that it can start popping through. How, how do you know you're not cutting the baby? Um, so you have to um, obviously be, be very delicate and ginger. So, you know, you really kind of go just a hair thickness at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, my protect, my particular technique is, um, uh, you know, I, so I go just sort of layer by layer and what, what starts to happen is the deeper layers start kind of bubbling out towards you. Mm. So that instead of me going down deeper, I'm kind of letting the tissue come out toward me. And, um, uh, often what'll happen is you'll, you'll start to see the amniotic sac and you know, you can kind of stop there and you just spread the muscles open and then the, the, the amniotic sac is still intact. And then I'll just kind of pop that open with a, a little clamp. Mm-hmm. Um, it is possible to cut the baby, and that happens on occasion. Mm-hmm. So it's something that you have to really you know, be careful. very careful about. How, how long time-wise from the time you said we're ready to start the cesarean until your hand is around the baby's neck? <laughs> you know, if you're kind of going, um, you know, leisurely, uh, it's a first surgery. You're not dealing with a lot of scars. It can be five minutes. Okay. But this is the kind of thing, if you have a big, bad emergency, mm-hmm. you can do most of this bluntly just with your hands. Mm-hmm. And you can have a baby out in 30 seconds. Wow. Wow. Okay. And then once, no, in in the case of a breech baby, you're yeah. not going to find a head down there. That's what I was right. wondering, too. What happens next? Um, so I you, mean, let's talk about it both <clears throat> ways. When you find the head, I assume you just, you said you lift it out, then you just lift the rest yeah, you of kinda, the head. Yeah, you guide the head up into the incision. So instead of pointing down toward the vagina, it's now pi- pointing up. Uh, towards the uterine incision. And usually uh, at, at this point, you'll take your other hand, put it on top of mom's uterus, and just give some pressure and kind of push down. And, uh, and that, that helps the baby kind of, kind of pop out. What does mom feel during that time usually? So mom can, you know, it varies um, uh, from case to case, also particularly depending on which type of anesthesia. The spinal tends to give you a lot better coverage. Mm-hmm. Epidurals can sometimes be a little more spotty. spotty. Um, you might feel your your body sort of being manipulated and moved around, and uh, you might feel a little tugging. You might feel the, the, the pressure on the belly. So there's definitely, you know, a, a C-section is not a sensation-free Experience, but I think it's the sensation of knife cutting through flesh you that people feel. are are more terrified about. Yeah, but that's something that I've never heard anybody say that they actually felt. Yes, and that's that's the purpose yeah. of the testing before you start to make sure there's no sensation in the skin before you start. Okay, I have so many questions. Do you have any questions at this point? Um, just what you asked. I'm just curious oh, the difference the between the breach, okay. if there's complications or anything like that, or the different way you so, get them out. So um, the, the the breach, um, in theory, you're supposed to deliver the breach the same way you do you deliver it vaginally. So you again, you reach the hand in through the uterine incision, and you'll wrap it around the baby's breech and lift the breech up into the incision. So the butt. so then the butt starts. Uh, 
you know, poking through the incision. In some cases, depending on the position of the baby, you might get the feet. Mm-hmm. That makes it a little easier because then mm-hmm. you can just grab the ankles and tug. and and tug and pull the baby out that way. But but in my experience, most commonly, um, you you get the butt, you lift it into the incision. You may have to hook a couple fingers around the baby's hips to start pulling through. And again, you're giving pressure on the top of the uterus to, uh, to help the baby down. Uh, so as the baby's butt and legs and back are all kind of emerging together, you you, you do it until most of the baby's body is out. And then you can start, um, yeah, this is much easier to see and it's kind of harder to describe just verbally, but uh, you, you can start uh, flexing the legs so that you can you know, gently fold the legs out. So you, if you can kind of picture now the baby's head and arms are still inside, mm-hmm. but the body and legs are now out. Uh, and then um, you rotate the baby to expose the arms and you can hook a little finger over the shoulders and slide down toward the elbow so that you can then draw the arms out. You rotate the baby the other way to get to the other arm. And then uh, the last thing is the head. And usually what you do is you put um, a hand down under the face, put a couple of fingers on the cheekbones, and you put some pressure downward just to help the head flex and then you know gently draw the head out. Is the incision bigger usually commonly for, just because it sounds like it's for a break? Com- coming out in a different shape? Um, you know, e- each individual surgeon um, will have their own preferences. Um, but I, I don't know that you need to make the incision bigger because you're removing the same baby. Right. You know, it, it's, it's, it, 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 it's the same size, whether it comes out head first or butt first. So I, I don't, th- that thought never goes through my mind that I need to make the incision bigger because it's a breech baby. Uh, other people might have that thought. You know, I couldn't speak for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, just briefly, because soon we'll start talking about how we can make this all a little more gentle. But uh, what happens after that in terms of the rest of the surgical portion of things? Uh, okay, so the old school way is um, the uh, there's a pediatric team there present in the room. So after the baby is born, uh, there's immediate cord clamping. And um, the baby's passed off to the the, the team of pediatric staff that's there in the room. So that could be anybody from a pediatrician to respiratory therapist to maybe even a neonatologist, but, but whoever the team is in the hospital. And they take the baby over to the baby warmer and they start you know, doing suction and getting fluids out of the mouth and checking on the baby's heart rate. And then they end up doing a whole full physical exam and you know looking for any kind of anomalies and checking the hips and uh, taking taking their um, their good old sweet time with the baby, um, so there's a period of separation between mom and baby that I think you know historically uh, it, within the maternity care system this not, has not really been thought to be a thing or an issue or 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 a problem. Uh, they'll wrap up the baby and kind of bring over to mom, and you get to kiss the baby on the cheek and you know meet the baby for a second, and then they'll take the baby somewhere. Maybe it was a nursery, or maybe they go to the recovery room. Historically, uh, you know, after C-section, there's been a substantial separation between you know mom and baby, and that could be half an hour, it could be a couple of hours, it could be you know a, a prolonged period of time. What's happening with her during that time? What do you still have to do? Uh, so then you have to remove the placenta, and then manually um, you take it out. There's different ways to do it. Some people actually just reach in and grab it and yank it out. Uh, some people wait for the uterus to clamp down a little bit with um, you know some tension on the cord and kind of let the uterus uh, deliver the placenta. So there's different different people have different styles, uh, and then you need to sew up the um, the uterine incision. And, uh, and close up the uh, abdominal wall. How long does that take? So that'll take, you know, a routine first C-section can all be done uh, not unreasonably somewhere like 20 to 30 minutes. Oh, from start to finish. Start to finish. And you're out playing golf. <laughs> yeah. What, um, I, we're going to go to a break and then come back and talk about the gentle portion of this and the, and the, and the microbiome seating, but... Um, once we have you here, are there things that you do? Should uh, should a mom be thinking about 
having more babies down the road and wanting to set herself up for vaginal birth after cesarean. Are there things that you can do to specifically promote that, make make that make her more suitable for that? The the major thing is um, that people talk about is when you close a uterine incision, uh, a one layer closure versus two layer of stitching closure of stitching. Yeah, and um, there are some uh, you know as much as this talk is is talked about. If you really look closely at these studies. Uh, it, it's not really a slam dunk that there's much of a difference between one and two layer closures. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I mean, I tend to always do a two layer closure. Uh, there may be some benefit to that. Maybe it makes the uterine closure a little bit stronger in preparation for the for the next layer. Mm-hmm. But I, I I don't think it's an absolute requirement. And let's say, for example, I had a woman who wanted to do a VBAC. And we got her operative report and we reviewed it and I discovered it's a single layer closure. That wouldn't hold you back. I would not use that to uh, disqualify her. Okay. Uh, any question before we go to break? No. Okay. We're going to take a quick commercial break and be right back with Candice and Dr. Emiliano Shavira talking about gentle cesarean birth and uh, in the next segment, microbiome seeding. <laughs> Sleep and Feed is a patent-pending revolutionary multifunctional baby nesting system which serves as a nursing pillow and traveling bassinet all in one. With special technology, the Sleep and Feed has the ability to transform into different feeding positions, and it accommodates babies from newborn to one year old. Ultimately, these features make this a great investment. The Sleep and Feed is made of advanced, highly technical soft fabric, which has the ability to not only be waterproof, stainproof, and antimicrobial, but be breathable and temperature regulating as well. Whether you need to travel, nurse, or just lounge with your baby, Sleep and Feed is a great option for your growing family. You have to see it. Check out sleepandfeed.com. That's sleep, the letter N, feed.com. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and we are continuing our discussion of gentle cesarean birth and microbiome seeding with our guests, eminently do mama, Candice, and Dr. Emiliana Shavira. And um, you, I think, really neatly laid out what the procedure's like, which uh, in, during the break, Candice was saying, that sort of helps to wrap your mind around it uh, for you. But then you said your other thing is, like, what about Naturally, there are things that take place that during childbirth that promote the health of the baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what happens when those aren't there? Um, what can you do to help your baby stay just as healthy? And then the other thing that we were going to talk about is how can we take that clinical model of cesarean? What kind of things can you do to to create what Candace called a, a spiritual experience in childbirth, uh, even though it's a, it's a cesarean birth? Yeah, you know, there's uh, it, pe- people are really um, thinking about this a lot these days, and some people are going way beyond thinking and, and changing the way we do cesarean deliveries. And I think each one of those steps along the way, you can think about it um, and find new approaches, you know, beginning with, you know, how you consent. There, there are ways to make it, you know, really scary and horrible, and there's ways to be, you know, very reassuring about it. When you go into the room... Uh, whether we uh, separate the woman from her support team. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's something we have historically done. I think that's something that we really can give some thought to. Maybe that can be done differently. And in in the changing climate, I see it seems to be up to the anesthesiologist, though. Yeah. I was going to ask, are there exceptions? If you say, you know, I faint every time I get my blood taken, it might be better. There's less likelihood of my partner fainting yeah. You know, something like that. Yeah. Less less likelihood of either of you fainting if you can stay together. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. And I, I do see them allow that from time to time. Okay. So it's a conversation and that you can have. And also the I've requested to have my doula come in, uh, in no, not mm-hmm. during the anesthesia if that's what they're saying, but just you said only one person is typically allowed in. 
Yeah, Is typically there exceptions that's the rule. to that. As I know well. I've I've seen a couple of exceptions to that too in a you know in something that's a non-emergency cesarean. Right. But it also seems to be up to the anesthesiologist who's yeah. uh, who's allowed to come in there. Yeah. Uh, they 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 control a lot of what goes in goes on in in ORs and uh, it's really hard. I I could not speak on behalf of another hospital mm, or you right. know another surgical team. So that would be something that that you or anybody listening would have to basically, you know, um, speak with their specific team. You're at multiple but hospitals. Do some of your hospitals allow? They you know they they vary. So there's some hospitals I work in that are much more traditional, and there's some that are more. Um, you know, accepting of, you know, different approaches. And it, it kind of gets to, um, you know, the, the issue of protocols and, and policies in hospitals. And uh, the practice of medicine is becoming increasingly, you know, regimented and protocolized and, you know, everything surrounded by policies. Now, there is uh, an element of that which is, I think, critical and essential and very important to making things safer and better. And I, I believe in in protocols and if you want to do some really interesting reading there's um there's a there's a book by Atul Gawande called mm-hmm. The Checklist Manifesto which is just an uh, a fascinating uh discussion of you know the use of protocols at the same time the downside of protocols is if everybody becomes robotic and nobody thinks mm-hmm. and nothing is individualized and the the, the human being in question is no longer treated as a human being, but is sort of the next widget on the uh, on the assembly line. And there's 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 a danger in that, and there's a downside in that. And there's also it's very dehumanizing. And so I think what we have to learn to do in medicine is to appropriately apply protocols where they're doing a lot of good and generating, you know, good outcomes and generating safety. And then on the other side, keep our humanity and individualize things and make exceptions when exceptions are appropriate. Flexibility. Words, and flexibility. Words, so we, we have to learn how to apply this, you know, um, artfully. Um, other things during during the cesarean that come up that our patients bring up all the time. You mentioned hand strapping, that sometimes mm-hmm. your arms and legs are strapped down. And I see some some facilities do it and some don't. But our patients definitely report back that if even one hand, but especially both, are free, it's a much different experience than if they're totally strapped down. Yeah. Um, when you're doing a cesarean, you know, I don't know what you were planning, Candice, about uh, delayed cord clamping or not delayed cord clamping, or if you had we're given gonna, that thought. Yeah, we wanted to delay. Can you do th- you Did you say you can do that with the you, cesarean? You absolutely can do cord clamping during a cesarean. Delay and- it. Delayed cord clamping, yeah, uh, that that's been looked at, and you know the the concern from the traditional obstetrician is, while I'm delaying the cord clamping, meanwhile the incision that I've made in the uterus is bleeding and bleeding, and and this is going to be dangerous for the mom. That's the that's the theoretical concern, uh, but it turns out you know they've done studies on this, and when you do delayed cord clamping. Uh, it doesn't really seem to generate any adverse effects on the mom. It doesn't, uh, you know, increase blood loss. It doesn't increase the frequency of transfusions. So it appears to be a safe thing to do. Well, you're talking about a couple of minutes delay. It's not like we're going to delay it for half an hour. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the the bulk of the benefit of the transfusion in most babies is going to happen in a minute. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you have a policy of delaying a cord clamp for one minute after the the birth, you're going to give the bulk of the benefits of delayed cord clamping to those babies without you know putting the mom at any any significant risk. Yeah, and the benefit we're talking about is blood from the placenta moving into Going the to baby. baby yeah. um, the clear screen you mentioned that for a mom who wants to be more involved and see the birth that she could um, potentially ask for a clear screen, a clear drape. Uh, of course, sometimes with a vaginal birth, moms don't want to see what's happening either. So it's just right. individual choice. Yeah, what their needs are. But you know, I I, I think um, there's there are all kinds of permutations of of this. So um, in some cases, they have a traditional blue drape, 
And what teams have done is just lowered the drape so that the mom can see the baby being born. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that, that uh, you know, a lot of moms have really enjoyed. And then they've invented these clear drapes so you can just see through it so that, that, that there's no longer an obstruction. And I've even seen some cases where they gear up the mom in sterile gear and put her in a surgical gown and uh, put gloves on her. And I've seen cases where they drop the drape and mom reaches down and actually brings her baby out, pulls yeah. the baby out of her body. I was which, wondering about that. You know, so that's, uh, that's a thing that can be done easily during a vaginal birth. You know, mom can reach down and, and you know, deliver her own baby. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had some experiences where, with that where the mother describes this as just the, the most incredible thing ever. And it's something that actually, uh, you know, can be done in a cesarean. Now, I think at this point in time, uh, there are probably going to be very, very few operating room teams that are set up to do with it, set up to do this, and are comfortable doing this. So I don't want listeners to think you can just ask for that and it's going to happen. Uh, you, you, you're very likely to um, get the response. What are you crazy? We're not doing that. Uh, but this is an idea that people have and have actually done. It's a thing that you know. There's some some precedent for it. So so people are kind of thinking outside of the uh, outside of the box these days. And then after the baby comes, you mentioned usually a, a neonatal team taking the baby to another area of the room to do their analysis and their suction. But we're seeing more and more that you could actually do safely skin to skin right, right. after birth. Or is there is that something that you would have to prepare for differently? What's the downside of skin to skin? No, I don't think you have to prepare for it diff differently. It really it just needs to. The requirements are that. Uh, the team has to believe that this is a worthwhile thing to do and they have to be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. That's really all you need. You need a mom and you need a baby. Mm -hmm. And you usually have those two, you know, two when you're doing a cesarean. Um, so it really is it, it, skin to skin. It's just a matter of, of willingness. And uh, thing, there are certain things that the anesthesiologist can do, like the little sticker tapes for the EKG. Instead of putting them on the front of the chest, maybe they put them on the back. Mm -hmm. And oh. they read mom's EKG from the back Interesting. so that the chest can be, um, you know, bare Free. when the, when the baby comes I assumed it was along. something to do with the sterile environment. Um, yeah, but when you're above the drape, that part is not sterile. Right. So the, if the baby is born... Once the baby's out. ...through the surgical in, uh, incision, right? And then we pass off to the pediatrician or the pediatric team. And then they walk around to the other side of the drape where... So it doesn't affect the where incision. ...where the mom and her... Right. right it doesn't affect... And right. then you just hand the baby to the mom. Because I, I did bring that up to my doctor, and it seemed like it had something to do with the sterile environment. But interesting, interesting. Yeah, that that's just... I think you're just sort of seeing a... Uh, just sometimes there's a knee-jerk reluctance to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And, and well, they may not even know what the concerns are. The other concern I hear doctors bring up is that mom may be weak in, her, in your arms and not be able to support the baby, in which case somebody else sort of holds the baby on mm -hmm. your chest for you. So you have to, um, it, you know, it, it, would be a, it would be a horrific thing for a baby to fall off of the operating table and, you know, land on the ground. Mm -hmm. That would be horrific. So, uh, so some, so you have to pay attention and you have to put some thought into this. Um, if you have a mom, let's say that is, you know, very uncomfortable during the C-section and they give her additional medicine, medications to kind of deal with the pain of the C-section and maybe she's not completely alert. Um, maybe that's somebody that you don't, not a great time. You know, not a great candidate. Yeah. Um, um, but if that's not the case, if mom is fully alert and, you know, the, the an, an epidural or a spinal really should have no effect on the arms. Mm -hmm. If you're weakening the arms, you are also weakening the lungs and the mom is not breathing and you're going to be putting her under general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. There is such a complication from epidural. That's an extremely rare complication that you almost never see. It's called a high spinal um, but really, if you're breathing and you're awake, your arms should be fine. Strong enough. Uh, mom also should have somebody 
with her who can kind of help you an extra set of arms and make sure yeah. that, you know. All the more reason to light your doula and then yeah. you know, right. to your partner. <laughs> right. I mean, there's usually somebody, uh, you know, there, there, there are cases where you're in there with the mom alone and doing the C-section that I always, you know, kind of feel sad about that. But most of the time there's somebody with mom. So as long as we're being careful and paying attention and it's a mom that's completely, you know, awake and alert – and you're careful about maybe this particular situation, let's just keep the baby on the warmer. That's going to be safer. Again, you're in individualizing to the situation. But there's no reason you need to say as a blanket rule that, that skin to skin is a you know dangerous thing to do. I think other other things that people do to try to make their birth more sacred and, and it can shine the spotlight on the birth and not so much on the surgery is to refer to it as a birth rather mm -hmm. than a section or a procedure and to sort of get everybody in the room. How many people are in the room typically when this is happening? Um, you'll have one anesthesiologist uh, or maybe maybe – Sometimes there's two setting up, and one will be walking in and out. But so it'll be one or two anesthesiologists. Usually, you're going to have uh, doing the delivery itself. There's going to be um, uh, two surgeons: the primary surgeon, the assistant, and then there's a uh, what's uh, an OR technician, or they call them scrub tech. So this is the person that's you know handing the uh, instruments Bunch. back and forth to the. Uh, okay. And then there's another person in the room called the circulator. And they get equipment and supplies and bring it to the sterile field. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have whatever team you have for the pediatrician, for the, for the baby. So there's a, there's so a good no handful less, of people. No less there. than eight people, it sounds like, in the room um, from, from the medical side. And then whoever, mom, mom and whoever she brings in. And, of course, at the end, there's another one who pops out of you. So, well, they were in there at the beginning as well. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but now they're out and about wherever mm -hmm. they them. That was one thing that my doula mentioned that definitely did affect the way I'm perceiving this. Is she said, from now on, we refer to it as a cesarean birth, no more C-section. So it just it still feels like you're having a birthing experience as opposed to because you a are. surgery. I, I realize that now, but yeah. before I was not feeling that way. Right, because you call it a C-section. I, I don't even know if there's another surgical procedure called a section besides cesarean. Yeah. Section. Um, it's just a harsh word. And um, but again, that focuses on the surgical element. Exactly. And it's, you can call it cesarean birth, abdominal birth. It's a birth. It's yeah. very much a birth. It's that sacred, beautiful moment where your baby comes into the world. And if you can get those other 10 people in the room to also refer to it as a birth. And and, you know, I think sometimes it becomes routine for for teams of people who do this all the time for circulators who are always in there doing a birth, um, it becomes work and right. they're not so touched by the sacred moment that's going on. <laughs> but to take a moment and remind everybody that this is a birth and we'd like to really focus on that and to, and now I see you can have your music playing and, um, you know, do they allow oils? You can still do that. Oils? You can still play your music and have all your mood I'll tell stuff. You, I'll tell you a story about music, but, re, you know, regarding the choice of language, that's, um, that's probably a good thing to put into your uh, birth plan mm -hmm. because it, that's not necessarily a concept that all practitioners will be attuned to, and they they may just be used to saying delivery and and um, so if 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 that's something that has an effect on you, you put it in your birth plan. You know, I really wanted to, to describe my birth as a birth, so you know, please use that word just to alert them to that. You know, you like that. Mm -hmm. Regarding the music, I, re I remember there was a couple I took care of with the, they uh, they were having twins, and um, uh, you know I really love twin vaginal births, but they just had zero interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, they just wanted to do a C section, and um, but on the day of, I mean, they came in with the with the stereo, and they had chosen mm -hmm. music, and they were going to do this like a party, and. Mm -hmm. Um, in my mind, when I remember, uh, you know, this this uh, this C-section, I, I like I have this image in my mind of there was a disco ball. I don't I don't think there was a disco ball, <laughs> but I sort of remember it like there was a disco ball, and you know, it was just this really kind of fun, joyous um, event. And it was I, honestly, as much as I, you know, there was a part of me that was kind of like, oh man, we're not you know doing a, a vaginal birth. It was really. Uh, it was really fun and wonderful, and we, you know, uh, we still talk about this, you know, birth to this day. And that's true. I think with vaginal birth too, it's important to point out sometimes people want a fun experience. Sometimes people want a more sacred and, and you know, and serene quiet experience. experience. Serene experience. Yeah. Having the music would be a big 
game changer for me when it comes to this because it just distracts your mind. I think you can have your music, and I also think if you want to do, you just have earbuds where you're in oh, your own little world with yeah. your music. Um, and also, I I see people bringing in essential oils now, like uh, lavender and mm-hmm. like a little washcloth that you put near your face, and you know you can close your eyes and that and makes sort me of really happy there. to know that you can still do that kind of stuff. I thought. All the little extras that I wanted music, were off the table. Music is pretty typical in ORs. Really? Yeah, I would think that would be something that in most cases, if you talk about that, you would get the yes. Now, you you may have come across some old curmudgeon who's like, oh, <laughs> we don't have music in our OR. I, I can't say that's impossible, <laughs> Yeah. but I, I think most people would, would be very accommodating about that. That's little, great. That little Bluetooth speaker. That's great. All yeah. right, I want to talk about microbiome seeding since we promised that we would, and it's an interesting topic. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it, so we might do a whole episode on it down the road but um, there's a lot of things that nature has in mind during this uh, during this rite of passage of childbirth and we don't fully understand a lot of it but we do understand some of it and we're understanding more and more all the time and one of the things that happens when a baby comes through during a natural birth during a vaginal birth is that um, the baby becomes exposed to its mother's microbiome to her her bacteria vaginally and um, colonizes that bacteria, because we need bacteria, we have good bacteria in our body that helps us do things, um, colonizes that bacteria and starts to create their own normal um, bacterial flora. And it's, it doesn't happen the same way in a cesarean birth coming out abdominally. So there's this concept of vaginal seeding. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very clear that the bacteria that the baby inherits, the baby, the bacteria that ends up setting up shop is different between babies that are born vaginally and, and babies that are born by cesarean. And uh, this is really a, a very rapidly uh, developing area where a lot of research is going on and, and people are starting to discover things. So there's a lot of attention paid to the long-term health outcomes in kids that are born by cesarean versus kids that are born vaginally. And they're starting to find a little bit higher chance of certain health issues um, after cesarean birth. So these are things like, uh, you know, like, like allergies, uh, rheumatologic disease. This would be things like, like, like lupus, inflammatory conditions, you know, juvenile arthritis. Um, One uh, really big one is uh, obesity, um, asthma. Um, and so one of the questions is, could it have something to do with the difference in the microbiome that the child inherits as a consequence of their mode of birth? Um, and I don't think we know 100% that that's the explanation. It's probably a little piece of it, and there's probably multiple other factors. But so the idea that has occurred to some people is, well, if the baby needs the bacteria that are in the vagina and we don't get that through a C-section birth because we bypass the birth canal, how about taking some of that bacteria and putting it on the baby after birth to see if that colonizes the baby the way it would have been had there been a vaginal birth. So that's that's sort of the concept. Usually it's done uh, with like maybe putting a gauze inside the vagina so it kind of soaks up you know, the maternal fluids. At what point? Uh, before the C-section. So on the day of? Yeah. Uh, there might be a lot of different ways of doing this. It might be right before the C-section. You might even do it after the C-section. Uh, we don't really know if this works, mm-hmm. if it's a good thing to do, and if it is, what's the optimal way of doing it. Um, then what do you do with it afterwards? Then you basically wipe down the baby with it. You don't put it in the mouth? Um, so there's not a protocol for this. Um, uh, it, it's, you know, what's described is kind of wiping around the baby's mouth and, oh, okay. you know, on the skin. Um, uh, Babies have other access to your microbiome also. Like there's mm-hmm. some of your bacteria in, in, in during breastfeeding, for example, that they get exposed to. Yeah. It's not the only way, but um, it. It's sort of a, a new concept, and I think the most important thing to understand is that we're seeing a difference 
in babies and the bacteria that they inherit, whether by mode of delivery, vaginal versus cesarean. But after that, it's sort of all new and mm-hmm. experimental, trying to figure out how we can give that baby more of your exposure to your, you know, to inherit yeah. your bacteria. It's fascinating. How new is this? Because I thought it was going to, uh, that was one of my main questions. Like, isn't there a way to like rub whatever all over the baby? It makes, I wasn't sure if it would be yeah, silly, but. I, no, it's, it, it's uh, well, it's ingenious and it makes perfect sense. Um, you know, the, the microbiome has been studied for many, many decades. Mm-hmm. But what's happening now is because our, our, our technology regarding the ability to study, you know, genetics that we're we're actually much better able to study this now, so it's just exploding. Uh, the thing about the vaginal seeding, I mean, I don't know who was the first person who came up with this idea and 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 when that was. But my view of it is this is a brand new thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is a new idea. It's a new concept. If you look in the medical medical literature, there is one study that has been published. And there were 11 women that had a cesarean section, and they took four of them, and they did the vaginal seeding. So it's a, an enormous study, vast. That's right. It took uh, <laughs> 17 years to complete. Um, and, you know, it was an interesting finding because uh, these four kids that, that underwent the vaginal seeding procedure, uh, when they did tests later to, to uh, analyze their microbiome, they were more similar to the kids that were born vaginally. So it, it kind of seemed to have an effect. However, um, one, one lesson that we have learned over and over and over again in the history of medicine is if you have a study that's based on a small number of cases, you can get really, really misleading results. Sure. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, from a, from a scientific point of view, there is a lot of reason to think that there might be something to this, but we don't really know if this works, you know. Or the uh, best way to does, do it. Yeah. Does, or if there's it, a downside to it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and so the American College of OBGYN, their official point of view is we don't recommend that people do this. And um, initially, my, my first reaction to this uh, was like, oh, God, I mean, ACOG just never wants anybody to do anybody. And I thought, <laughs> for, for crying out loud, like, we're fine letting the mother actually pass the baby physically through the vagina. <laughs> right, but but it bothers that. us to, you know, to put a little swab on the baby. But, um, I, you know, I re- Thinking through it, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this, uh, you know, for the past few months. And, then, and when you read their statement, it actually does make a lot of sense because uh, it's it's possible that doing the seeding may not actually colonize the baby the same way a vaginal birth does. Mm-hmm. And there is a potential maybe you could put pathogens on the baby, you know, like GBS or herpes or chlamydia yeah, or STDs. something. Yeah, STDs. I wondered about that. STDs. So, um so I think being fair about it, there is a potential risk, and we don't really know how beneficial it is. So I, I, I think it's fair to say we don't really have good data on this and, you know, whether it's overall, you know, more helpful or harmful. Something to think about. And and there is more investigation going on. So hopefully over time we'll have a lot more information on how we can use this beneficially without doing harm. Um, we're at the end of our discussion. Do you have any other questions? Um, I do have some questions. I, wh- I guess what would help me is to just get a little tidbit from you of just how routine a cesarean is. Like how basically just try to make me not feel so scared of it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I could say a lot to reassure you. I mean, they are super routine. Um, most, um, uh, you know, obstetricians have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cesareans. Uh, these days they have become incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I, I think, um, if you, you really can, I mean, you can, you can turn it into a birth Mm -hmm. and put all of the things in, into it that, you know, spiritually that you wanted to have, um, you know, you can put them into birth. And as you're, you know, nurturing and raising this baby, you're going to do all of the same things that you were going to do 
anyway. You know, you're mm-hmm. you're you're going to be a wonderful mother, and you, the baby's going to be fine, and it's all it's 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 going to work out. Lovely. I also think <laughs> you're you're so healthy in general, like you said, you're holistic, you're natural, like you take good care of your mind and body. So I think that you're also going to recover in in a way, in a very healthy way, a strong, healthy recovery afterwards. Um, I think when somebody's not in shape, like if I had a C-section, it would be a disaster. <laughs> but for you, I think it would be just fine. The um, the uh, the other thing, that, the, the comment you made earlier on as we were talking, you know, worried about freaking out and fainting and all mm-hmm. these things, it, it really, it's a non-concern. Um, you will not faint, um, but if you did, the anesthesiologist is there to take care of it. It would be fine. Yeah. Um, once in a while, we uh, we do a C-section and the mom is freaking out, you know, anxious and and freaking out. And you know what happens? You just you do the C-section. You you get through it. Like you're not gonna you're you're not gonna cause a complication in the surgery. You're not gonna. Oh, it's, good. It, it's 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 it, that's really not a thing you need to worry about. Oh, okay. That yeah. is reassuring. Yeah. I think once you wrap your mind around it, you're gonna make it awesome. Well, hopefully this little one. Should you have one? I know. My I, partner's like, quit talking about it. It's not yeah. going to happen. No, I th- <laughs> well, I mean, I think what you're doing is looking at it as there's a chance that – there's always a chance it was going to happen. That's true. Right? But you brought up something before we started recording, which is that this is strange because you know about it weeks in advance. Mm-hmm. And so, like, how do you wrap your mind around it then and how do you prepare for it then? Mm-hmm. But I sort of think if you – you, with the homework that you're doing and, and even how relaxed you are about it now compared to a, a week ago or 10 days ago, mm-hmm. um, I think if you, if you realize that you're going to do it, You'll get your mind around it. You'll get ready for it, and you'll make it an amazing experience for you guys. Yeah. Well, you, Dr. Berlin, have been so helpful in easing that for me, and also Dr. Shabara, you as well. Thank you so much for this conversation. It has made me feel much better. Hooray. Well, we'll come back at some point and and tell everybody how your birth went. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for being here. I know it's not easy for you to talk about these things, and... um, and uh, you are our listener. A lot of our listeners are mm-hmm. in the same shoes that you are. So it's really helpful that you're here to ask questions on their behalf. <laughs> uh, and Dr. Shavira, thanks as always for being here. Your point of view on things um, is really unique and refreshing. And I, I appreciate you sharing them. And I appreciate being able to refer clients to you so that they also don't have to freak out. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I always love uh, chatting with you. You ask great questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Uh, At home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. If you have a topic you'd like us to discuss, drop us an email at info at informedpregnancy.com and then go visit us online for more pregnancy and parenting media at informedpregnancy.com. Doctor, doctor, give me the news I got.